Hello, everyone. This is Jeremy Lair. Welcome to The Money Movement, a show where we explore the brave new world of digital currency and blockchains. I'm very excited to be back with some new programming and in particular, really, really excited to be here with Michael, who is co-founder uh, and CEO. Uh, I think that's your title uh, of Star Atlas, or maybe you go by by like Captain, or uh, I'm not sure what, you, what your title is, but maybe we can get to that. But very, very excited to have Michael on. Um, Star Atlas is a really, really incredible project um, in the crypto space, in a lot of spaces, in in economics in the way uh, people are experimenting with governance, in art and culture, in gaming, in finance, like it touches so many, so many topics that I think are just really, really fascinating. And I think it's um, one of the projects out there today that expresses and connects so many different um, disciplines. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so excited about it uh, because it's, it's really innovating at the cutting edge of so many of those. So we're gonna have a great conversation with Michael about Star Atlas and some of those themes uh, in detail, but um, first, just you know, welcome, and uh, maybe you can just quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Really exciting to be on the show with you as well. And uh, you know, the community refers to me as Captain. I like to think of myself as, as just a humble servant of the people, but it it is quite endearing. But yeah, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of, of Star Atlas, amongst other projects in the crypto space. And um, my background is really in traditional finance as a CFA charter holder and working in portfolio management, investment and securities analysis. Um, kind of ironically, shortly after getting that charter, I, I went full time into crypto and thought I would never get to use that. But um, as it turns out, um, kind of with the economic design of Star Atlas itself, I, I've been able to pull from that tool set quite a bit. So again, really exciting to be here and just looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I had degrees in political science and philosophy and a, and a, and a minor in economics or, and I never thought I'd get to use all that. And, and now crypto, you know, it brings a, a lot of different disciplines together. Right. So, and we're actually going to talk about that. I think there's sort of political and economic systems that are being designed. And, um, and actually it's an interesting, just maybe a way to kick off the conversation. Um, you know, the metaverse as a concept um, people, I think struggle with that sometimes. Um, I want to hear your definition in a moment, but I think one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I think Star Atlas is emblematic of it, is um, the way in which these digital universes are really, um, they're living, breathing economic systems, but they're really experiments in ways that broader facets of the world might work in the future. They're laboratories for what might actually work in the future. And while the metaphor of this galactic exploration is a, is a metaphor, right? But we're actually seeing experimentation in basic units of organization and work and, and, and economic and political systems. And so it's just a, such a fascinating um, backdrop, but maybe, that, maybe that's a good way to start. Um, when you conceptualize what Star Atlas is, Maybe you could just talk about it at a conceptual level, and then maybe we can, you know, for, for folks that aren't familiar with it, talk about it at a more concrete level. Sure. Um, well, I love in your introduction, you used the term Brave New World. I think that was a great book and, and kind of a great mentality to approach this future that we're emerging into, um, a great mentality to approach it from. And in many ways, you know, not only are we exploring the future potential of humanity through crypto and decentralization and all of these alternative uh, kind of philosophical ide ideals, um, but we are genuinely creating a brave new world in Star Atlas, a digital universe within which a person should be able to persist. And so um, as a starting point, you know, so, so Star Atlas is multifaceted, but as a starting point, Star Atlas was a, a AAA video game concept. And so it's centered around this universe where space exploration takes place, territory control, political domination. And those are, are some of the core gameplay pillars that people will be introduced to when they join Star Atlas. And when I say AAA, this is kind of developing out to the highest quality gaming standards. So highest graphical fidelity. We're building in Unreal Engine 5 but also things like lore and storyline and gameplay mechanics and um, you know the various aspects of what it means to be a video game. 
Um, however, what I, what I always try to clarify is that the video game itself is really just the spearhead for us. Um, and this is our entry point into uh, a, a new way of thinking, kind of a new paradigm, right? And so people will be able to enter Star Atlas, engage in gameplay, but also be able to engage in some of these um, uh, constructs like governance and constructs like social interaction, human interaction and experiences. Um, and so, you know, evolving past the video game itself, what we see is the emergence of the metaverse being this place where it's not necessarily centered around gameplay itself or any of the mechanics that we have in gameplay, but rather an environment where opportunities are prevalent. And so, you know, people all over the world should be able to find an opportunity for themselves within the metaverse, even if it's outside of our core gameplay mechanics. You know, essentially, I think of the metaverse as, as uh, likely being the future of the web, I think it will be incredibly disruptive across things like e-commerce, uh, across social interaction. Um, to your point, the ability to experiment with new models for governance and economics and, and uh, society. Um, and we could see that bleed through to the physical world. Um, but, but really beyond that is, is uh, you know, this concept that it can become this living, breathing public utility for which the world as a whole has an opportunity to mold and, and form um, as it goes into the future. So um, I know a lot, lot to unpack there, but you know, realistically, I think it's the future of the web. It, it will change the way that we shop. It will change the way that we socialize online. It will create new economic opportunity for people. And um, I fervently believe that it really does need to be a public utility, not owned by a, a single centralized entity if it's to succeed. Yeah, there's so many lenses on, on the metaverse. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I talk a lot about um, how, you know, kind of blockchains, public blockchains are kind of, um, they're like a new operating system layer for the internet. And, and, and I, I really do, I, I mean, technically I, I have a technical background and I, I look at, you know, if you take a blockchain like Ethereum or a blockchain like Solana, right? Their computer computing environments, their data storage models, there's the transaction model, like the building blocks that you need to kind of create stuff, but it's internet scale, internet distributed. Um, so you have these kind of internet operating systems, but they're, they're purpose built around shared truth, digital property, um, and, 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 and enabling um, people to interact with that around the world. And in, in my mind, it's sort of a new global economic infrastructure. And the way I think about it is over time, organizations will just, they'll be principally based on this. And, and you're kind of, such an interesting microcosm of that because your own entity, Star Atlas itself is a, 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 a digital, um, a, a digitally native uh, organization. And you, I don't know if you call it a DAO, we can talk about how, what Star Atlas itself is. Sure. Um, you know, we, we don't need to get into like your, your underlying legal structure per se, but just like, you know, it, it is itself uh, an entity that has stakeholders and has participants but then within, this is the metaverse piece, within Star Atlas, it's a universe where people can create their own corporate forms mm -hmm. and have value exchange and have work and labor and property that's real. I mean, it's, it's, it's very real to the participants. Uh, so you're kind of meta here because Star Atlas itself is set up that way. And then you can instantiate these things inside of it, which is kind of mind bending. But I, again, in this concept of that we're, this is this new economic infrastructure and it's this laboratory that's taking place. You're an interesting microcosm, but maybe you could talk about Star Atlas itself, what it embodies in terms of these new types of corporate forms. Definitely. Um, there are layers of complexity both inside of the game as well as externally, but um, I just wanted to touch on a point. I've read, you know, the Bitcoin white paper a dozen times, probably. I've, I've read through all of Satoshi's uh, posts on Bitcoin talk. And I, you know, as much as these are technological systems that, you know, to your point are building blocks, I still think the greatest invention of Bitcoin itself is the elimination of human trust. 
mm -hmm. out of the equation. It's, it, I mean, that is what was accomplished through the blockchain and through yeah. open source decentralized tech. But, um, you know, and it's, we genuinely are building on the shoulders of giants with everything that we do and being able to leverage this technology and think about this industry that has emerged as a result of, you know, a concept and idea that was brought to life. So I think it's amazing. But um, for us, it, you know, it's kind of odd. We, um, so we are a centralized company, but we also operate a decentralized economy and ecosystem. Um, from our viewpoint, we are kind of the, the, caretakers of this concept of the metaverse in the early years. And so our vision is essentially to develop out this product that starts as a video game and then um, it evolves into you know, more experiential uh, interaction with the metaverse. But um, you know, we understand that we need to have pretty tight control over product creation in the short term. And short term, I'm saying three to five years, maybe seven years. Um, that will enable us to deliver this product out to the world that we think the world is going to want to consume and want to enjoy. Um, however, side by side, we have the entire economy that exists inside the metaverse, which will grow over time in theory. Um, and we have a decentralized autonomous organization structure um, that is driven and governed by stakeholders of one of our tokens, the Polis token. We have two atlases, the medium of exchange currency in the game. Polis is the governance token. Um, and that permits those governors to influence in the long-term development decision-making processes that we make as a company. Mm -hmm. So things like feature releases or asset release schedules or contributing to modifications of the governance system or even the economic system it's, itself, you know, emission rates and inflation rates in the game, things like this. Um, within the game, we also have a three-tiered DAO structure that we're working on making a turnkey solution for the user base, but that includes DAOs at the faction level, at a regional level, kind of like a local solar system, and then all the way down to the guild level. So we call these decentralized autonomous corporations, but it's essentially the guild system in the game. And the idea is that we can empower these guilds to have their own internal governance structures and manage their own treasuries on how best to interact with the game, you know, whatever's most enjoyable, but yeah. also in theory, most efficient from a productivity standpoint. So uh, long-term for us, the DAO will actually take over and own the metaverse itself, as well as all of the economic value that's created within it. And we as a company, uh, we ultimately become a, a, a almost a, a contractor to the metaverse. So right now we have the exclusive mon monopolist. I guess the metaverse, the polis holders could eventually hire other you know, other developers that have grown in the community who want to contribute to the, to the, to this as well. Right. That is the idea. And again, you know, we keep pretty tight control. Initially, we have the majority of the, the kind of like the stakeable pull of supply. Um, but it's designed such that over time through emissions, uh, we essentially get inflated away. The world then who has earned polis over time gets to determine what the outcome of it is. But that allows a, a really interesting um, potential outcome, which is this is not a product that would live for say five years or 10 years. Right. Um, in theory, this is a product that could evolve in perpetuity. It could, you know, again, it, once it becomes the public utility, anybody can contribute to it and modify it and mold it into what it needs to be. And yeah. it can just live on forever in digital space. If only there was a DAO for the, for Pac-Man. Seems like Pac-Man <laughs> forever, but uh, I mean, you were running around collecting coins, so I, or or maybe not. Maybe those are pills. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, there, there's so many places we can take the conversation. I think the concept of these guilds, basically individual entities, individuals inside of Star Atlas, being able to form their own corporate entities, um, and and that's going to be something that that will be possible in the game. Let, let's maybe make it more concrete for people. And, and, and I, I do want to come back to technology in a little bit because because I think you've made some really interesting technical choices. And, and, and I want to connect the dots for listeners to sort of what the state of the art is in, in this kind of technology as well. But maybe just in terms of the, the this kind of um, gameplay, as it were. Um, so I'm an individual and I'm like, hey, this is really cool. I want to like... I want to go, um, I want to, I want to play in this world, or I just want to come in this world. I want to see if I can get a job. I want to own something. Uh, how, how, how could I like be part of a, uh, of a, of a, of a, of a, you know, a, a decentralized autonomous corporation 
that someone decides to start in the game and, and what might I bring to the table and how might I do that um, just as a starting point? Yeah, there, so there's a couple of things there uh, that I would touch on. Um, first of all, the, cor the, the DAX, the Decentralized Autonomous Corporations, have actually been forming in our Discord as, as early as February of this year, before we had any content out, any product out, before we rolled the NFT marketplace out. Um, groups of people were starting to collaborate and coordinate on how they would like to execute in the game with very little information. Yeah. And we've seen that evolve. And those, those don't yet exist on chain. There's sort of people communicating about it at this point. Correct. That's 100% correct. So it's all, um, you know, just in communication channels, not official yet in the game. Yeah. That's coming very soon. Um, so, you know, for people that are interested in getting involved and, and finding a source of information, our Discord is a great place to go uh, because the community there is about 70 to 75,000 people strong. And a lot of them are um, very, uh, just call it vested in, in their interest in Star yeah. Atlas and they're willing to help and answer questions. And so it's a great community. So that, that's a good place to start. Um, with respect to getting entry into the game, and I, I love how you said, like, you just want to maybe just want to go get a job. Um, there's a couple of different demographics of users that we see. Uh, the first of which is the player. In order to become a player, you do have to own an asset. Um, I, I like to differentiate, though, between legacy games where it's almost rent based. You have to um, you, you purchase access to the title um, and the value that you get in return. <clears throat> is the entertainment value or the ability to escape reality for a period of time while you're playing. Um, however, once you leave that game environment, you often forfeit any of the assets or items that you earn. So it's kind of like renting, right? You rent a house, you get to use it while you're renting. When you move, you don't get to keep any of the value of that property. Um, our model is transformative in that there is a purchase requirement to get into the game, whether it's ships or land or you know, crew members or um, other forms of assets, but um, the value then is retained by the player. So that's the beauty of having NFTs as the asset base within the game. Um, now that asset also permits the player to create monetary value for themselves. So they can actually monetize time spent in the game through the deployment or use of these assets, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't have to get in too deep into the specifics of it, but that's, that's only one demographic. The second demographic is what you just referred to, which is if you don't have an asset at all, that doesn't mean you can't get involved in Star Atlas. There are many people that are contacting us right now that are interested in purchasing substantial portfolios of assets with no intent to play. They don't have the time to play, but they know that they can hire people to manage those assets and operate those assets for them in the game. And then there's a third demographic, which is people that are already offering services like consulting services on which ships to buy, for example, which combination of ships should people buy? So advisors of sorts um, that are making recommendations. And these are completely tertiary and outside of the metaverse itself and outside of the game, but they're, they're essentially building a business around how people should best interact with metaverse. And so I really think the metaverse itself is going to lead to the largest job market economy the world's ever seen because we eliminate all of the friction of geographic borders for employment. And we create these open markets for employment for everybody all over the world. I mean, th that whole dimension is fascinating. I, I mean, the fact that that there's digital property, the fact that uh, pe people can, can you know, obviously there's sort of native digital property, presumably over time, people can bring other digital property, create digital property in this. Um, they can create organizations that organize that capital in a sense, because property is a form of capital. It, it, it got me thinking a little bit um, about, um, you know, <laughs> there's sort of the Marxist uh, you know, theories of like labor and capital and work. And, um, you know, it was very grounded in, you know, it was the, the originally this, this movement from agrarian to industrial economies. And, um, you know, we, we sort of later had this idea of like post-industrial economies, the information age, you know, that was sort of Brave New World. Obviously, it was an interesting book at, the, at, at, at sort of a, a, a pivotal point there. But there's also, you know, Alvin Toffler, um, who I don't know if you read Alvin Toffler's work, but he was sort of, you know, the futurist. And he wrote about the third wave, which was, you know, this sort of information revolution. And um, and, and uh, Jeremy Rifkin, who was another interesting writer, would talk about the end of work. And all of these were sort of, kind of conceptualized, a lot of this is conceptualized in, you know, one was like the shift from like 
physical labor to knowledge workers. And we've sort of see, seen that now. It's, it's, this is not you know, equal all over the world, but we're seeing these like radical shifts in, 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 in labor and radical shifts in, 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 in productive work. And there's this overall narrative of, you know, essentially machines and robots and AI are, are gonna make a lot more work unnecessary. And so J Jeremy Rifkin had the theory, the end of work was there's, there's just gonna be plenty. There's just gonna be this plentiful world and everyone's just gonna be able to be an artist or pursue their kind of creative passions and so on and so forth. But I think in the reality of things is a little bit different, but we are seeing a world where, you know, um, knowledge work, you know, it, it, it is one opportunity for people. Um, another is physical work, right? But metaverse work is now like a very legitimate and growing part of the economy. And what's fascinating about it is, is this, these historical relationships between labor and capital um, existing now in the metaverse. And exactly what you just described, which is that you can have someone who owns digital property and then would like someone to use their property to till the land as it were, right? You know, I, I own this land, come and till the land, but now I own this like wicked cool spacecraft and I just don't have the time to like wield this thing. Uh, but you know what? I'm willing to, you know, enter into effectively like an on-chain contract where again, don't need trust. You can know like the, the, the you're never going to lose control of the asset. The asset's available to this particular, you know, owner of keys to be able to utilize it in this context in the game. And it has a time lock and like, you can actually build a contract in a sense that's expressed in a declarative way. And you're enabling a labor market to exist. And I, I know there's other examples of this play to earn, et cetera, that are out there. Um, but I, I think in some ways what you're, what you're envisioning um, it, it, it is, is one of the most powerful expressions of that potentially. But this really is a shift in how labor can work and, and how property can be owned. And it's all in a digital virtual form, which is, I think, to most people inconceivable that there might be, you know, in a few years, there might be 500 million people whose primary source of income is jobs in metaverses using property and interacting around property and participating in self-organized economic, you know, systems that, that are in there, it's just mind blowing. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious in your mind, when you think about that labor and capital and, and how big that can be as a, as a labor market, as it were, I mean, what do you think? I completely aligned with your thinking on it. And this is where, you know, we, we've had um, concerns that have been uh, brought up in our Discord channel, for example, people that aren't necessarily thinking about uh, the economy in, in the same perspective that we're describing it here, but just rather, um, you know, is it, are we going to reintroduce a feudal system where, you know, the whales, right. the whales get to buy everything, they get to own everything, and then other people can only go in and work for somebody else. And I, I, don't think that will be the case um, for one, just because this is going to be an incredibly competitive job market, right? It, it, there, once again, there is no friction of geography, of borders, of distance. You you can work for anybody in the metaverse, and and the way we're trying to design the economics are such that everybody should be able to get some access to land, uh, some access to ships, and through earnings over time, they can you know if they if they redeploy that capital back into themselves through upgrading items and purchasing bigger items, then they have the ability to earn more and more over time as a result of that. But um, without question, I think there there are going to be an enormous amount of people that are employed through the metaverse. Um, you know, a lot of credit to Axie Infinity, by the yeah. way. They, they, they were pioneering this model and they saw, um, well, whether they saw it or not, um, through, through the support of Yield Guild Games and Gabby Dizon, um, they essentially supported an entire economy yeah. in, locally in the Philippines as a result of this, this gameplay, right? Through the pandemic, they were able to support people financially, yeah. um, which I think is just the first demonstration of how this is going to function in the future. Right. You know, it's 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 so interesting because some at, at at you know a, a snide response will be, oh, this is just like gratuitous. This is like there's nothing here. This is this is all BS. But you know, the media and entertainment industry is I don't know how I don't know if it's 
a couple trillion dollars. I don't know. It's pretty big. Um, and when you think about the number of people who are employed in the production of film, the production of television, the production of AAA rated games, like the, you know, the, the production of news, all these things, there's an enormous amount of labor that is basically created for the purpose of, of people to uh, access some form of, of entertainment. This is, this is deeper than that, though. I mean, I think that's part of the point of, of all of this is this form of human interaction and entertainment um, it's just, it goes way beyond traditional, what we think of as entertainment. I mean, games have been evolving this way for a really long time, but this, this sort of goes even further where the participants become part of the creative class and are, are participating in, 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 creating these things. I, I just, I feel like people who just dismiss this outright as, um, you know, this is just some huge waste of time. I mean, you have to kind of Compared to what? Com compared to the how many people who build some stupid comedy that you know, or, or whatever you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I want to talk about um, some of the choices that you've made. Um, we'll talk a little bit about technology. I have to, of course, make a shameless plug for USDC. I see USDC is is a is, a, is currently uh, a way that people are are purchasing. Uh, property um, that that exists at the founding of the game. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how, how you're using USDC, and then I want to move to the some of the other technical choices that you made. You 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 chose to build this on Solana. Um, you know, I think like you, over a year ago, we got really excited about the architecture of Solana and and thought, you know, there's just gonna be a whole new class of applications that aren't possible today. They're gonna need USDC. We want to be there for whatever comes whether it's DeFi or now it's, you know, GameFi or, or, or what have you, but maybe talk a little bit about some of your choices um, in, in terms of how, you, how you've brought this up. Sure. And I, I do maybe just want to finalize one thought on the economy itself. And I, I do think that it's critical to create this self-sustaining economy that's not driven by inflation or emission rates of tokens. You know, it can't be purely extractive. You're yeah. never going to create a perpetual system where everybody goes into play and only gets to take out. Um, and so this is where the content creator uh, economy needs to take hold. People need to be creating businesses that create value inside the metaverse, external to the mechanics that we've introduced. And that might be somebody who starts an art gallery, right? Pur purchases some land, builds a building, creates an art gallery, curates NFTs, maybe from OpenSea on Ethereum, brings those into the metaverse and then sells those NFTs through, through his or her art gallery experience. Um, and, and to your point about entertainment, we think that that is going to be a major sector, performances, music festivals, um, you know, yeah. uh, other cultural experiences, museums, right? All of these things can be recreated inside the metaverse. And when value is being exchanged peer to peer, as opposed to developer to uh, player, um, that I think would lead to the long-term success of the metaverse. I think it's absolutely critical that we establish that. Um, so with respect to USDC, I mean, um, I've actually answered this a number of times only because uh, people are asking why we aren't like, enforcing Atlas or Polis uh, for the purchase of, of assets. But, you know, this is a massive endeavor and it's going to have significant capital requirements. We're estimating, you know, anywhere from 500 million to a billion dollars in the long term. Uh, Epic, who is the creator of Unreal, just raised a billion dollars to further develop out the metaverse. And they're a massive studio. So. Yes. Um, we know that the capital requirements are going to be heavy. Um, we have operating expenses. USDC works perfectly for us. We get to store our assets digitally. We get to deploy those assets in DeFi instruments that generate great yield, by the way. <laughs> you know, anywhere from something that's relatively safe at 8 to 10% to, you know, maybe moving out on the risk spectrum a little bit and generating 30 to 100% per year. Um, so it's a great way for us to generate uh, market operational income. Uh, on our otherwise, you know, dormant treasury assets. Um, so, and it's easy, it's seamless for us to move that in and out of the crypto ecosystem so that we can do things like pay payroll, you know, pay contracts and pay for services. So um, that's our primary use for it. And um, I think that going into the future where we would see USDC um, being valuable to the player base is that uh, we, we have a heavy emphasis outside of the game and metaverse on DeFi integrations. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want our players to be able to compound wealth that they're generating in the game, you know, earn Atlas or earn Polis in the game. Um, these are volatile assets by nature. It makes a lot of sense to liquidate some of that 
And instead of withdrawing to a bank account where it earns, you know, practically nothing now or negative yielding in some cases, uh, deploy that into a smart contract that or AMM or liquidity pool or something that can earn additional income for the player. So that's kind of where we're thinking going forward. But um, also on features such as uh, lending protocols, where, you know, we were talking about about the um, uh, kind of the labor force and people's ability to enter the game. Uh, well, if it's possible for someone to take a loan in USDC, purchase an asset and start playing with that and have this all executed through a smart contract where to your, you know, your exact point, these are secure assets, then uh, it's kind of a win-win. We get more people playing the game <clears throat> who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford a ship or parcel of land, but now they're just taking a loan out to do that. So I have some thoughts on that about essentially, you know, indebting people immediately upon joining the game. So it's still up for debate, but the lending protocols and markets, I think, are going to be uh, uh, beneficial to players. Net net and USDC would be one of those items. And I, yeah, I think one of the other things I noted is you're 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 sort of taking advantage of the composability and scalability of Solana. So you have something like USDC. You have a marketplace protocol like Serum, the Dex, uh, as an underlying kind of markets uh, engine. Um, some of these other things that you're looking at, NFTs that could be posted as collateral and you, someone could borrow USDC against uh, 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 Star Atlas NFT or, or, or things like that. But um, maybe just talk for a minute about, uh, again, some of the other kind of key choices that you've made in how you're building this. Yeah, so I mean, the, the purpose of selecting Solana was, uh, this was after extensive research and just identifying them as really the world's only web scalable blockchain technology. And given our vision for this product, what we wanted to accomplish with attracting not only you know tens of millions, but potentially billions of users, if we if we actually succeed in our mission of reaching the world with the metaverse, uh, we needed <laughs> blockchain technology that was capable of scaling to that user base. And so, um, while it's still early days, we we appreciate that um, you know uh, Solana is capable of greater than fifty thousand transactions per second. Subsecond finality on state changes, so that's like low latency interacting with the metaverse. Um, and then, you know, another critical component is just low transaction costs. So less than a penny per transaction. When you think about hundreds of millions of users all interacting with the, with the chain um, all the time, that's many, many millions of transactions, right? And technically transactions, they're state changes. So, um, so that was important. But I think, you know, Tolly, Raj and the team, those guys uh, gave us a lot of confidence in their ability. The algorithm that they've developed, the proof of history with the parallel transaction processing on the back end, I think it's brilliant. And um, but but perhaps more than that, we saw an opportunity to get involved early with a very promising blockchain. And so there were maybe 20 projects when we got involved. Uh, mm -hmm. We got an enormous amount of support from them early. As a result, they connected us with their entire community, and that was kind of the seed of our uh, of our current community. And we were able to grow from that. So. Um, and beyond that, you know, seeing endorsements from other institutional players, um, you know, like the the uh, consortium that has developed Project Serum, that that was also very promising to us, and it's led to some great relationships and has really helped us succeed. So, um, I, yeah, I have I, I have no doubt selecting Solana was one of the best decisions we could have made. Um, feel very confident about the potential going forward. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, well, uh, we've seen a huge amount of uptake. For USDC on on Solana, so um, we're and we're excited about the fact that you know I think a lot of people are overly focused on DeFi or or overly focused on uh, you know kind of trading kind of stuff, and I think uh, what you're doing and and this broadening out of of how the crypto economy and how this economic infrastructure and creative infrastructure and everything kind of fuses together, it's pretty amazing. Um, well, this is awesome. Um, this is, uh, it's like, like I said at the start, I think this is, you know, what you're doing is one of the really most interesting kind of uh, projects that brings together so many different dimensions in this space um, and uh, excited to see it. But for folks that are, um, you know, want to dig in more, what are some of the best resources uh, to do that? We post articles regularly on Medium. Uh, so I think it's just, you know, medium.com slash star dash atlas. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, join our, our Discord. A lot of information gets posted there. Very popular on Twitter, um, something like 120,000 followers there. And we're releasing uh, content um, drops pretty regularly. So things like concept art that you would, of how you would interact with the game, what it's going to look like. 
Um, you know, personally, you can also find me on Twitter just at underscore and Wagner. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, and you can also sign up for our newsletter. And if you haven't looked um, yet, the website staratlas.com, we just released a new version of the website. It's immersive. It's intended to pull you into the metaverse. I think we succeeded with that. And you can also find our um, our white paper on there, as well as a recently released game economics and tokenomic white paper that describe kind of how uh, value is is derived and utility is driven across the uh, the metaverse itself. Bye.